Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the podcast. Hope you're all good. Hope you're having a great day so far. Delighted to say Mike is back with me. Mike, how are you? I'm doing very well, mate. I had a, had a nice break. Um, I went to a lot of pubs in Belgium, in, in Brussels and Bruges, which uh, you, you were very happy about when I just told you. <laughs> very jealous. <laughs> um, you've become quite the pub enthusiast, haven't you, over the yes, years? Yes, I have, yeah. Yeah, no, I had a, had a nice break. Um, it was it was really good uh, as you know in this industry you kind of just got to take time out sometimes and reset and you know because the narratives i think you know especially arsenal fans will know that they just get they get really really familiar and they get really really boring and i think it's because you know we've only got about three weeks of football in this period and then there's another international break it happens three months in a row and it it just means that it's quite hard to move on from the previous sort of na- narratives that we're having because there's there's so little football and it's broken up so much that we're just constantly focused on on the last result and the last few results it's quite hard to see the see the bigger picture um but uh yeah hopefully well there's no more now to march are there so we can uh, we can get some proper football back there can be a tendency as well can't they during these international breaks to start to overthink things and i think you can get to a place where you start to look for problems that maybe don't always exist you can sort of go into something and and turn what might be a sort of minor issue into a mega issue just because there's no football to talk about. So you start going down these rabbit holes, you start going down the different routes of conversations and you can end up sometimes in very dark places, particularly if you end the period prior to the international break badly. Now, I don't think that was the case with us because obviously the draw at Chelsea wasn't the result necessarily that we were looking for, given how far behind uh, the pack we've fallen. But I think, I don't know about you, Mike, and we'll just touch on this very, very briefly, but I felt like the performance against Chelsea was a step back towards the Arsenal that we've become accustomed to over the last few seasons. We're not quite there yet, but it was a step in the right direction, surely. Yeah, it was much better. Definitely much better. I think, you know, from the from the Bournemouth and, and Newcastle games and, um, and uh, Inter as well, where we're literally struggling to, you know, play passes, um, aggressive passes at least through the through the middle of the pitch it was you know literally get it wide and cross was our, our basically our game plan um and you know that takes us back to the old days of Arteta doesn't it um but yeah it was it was so much more fluid and I think obviously it is quite easy to say that that's because of Odegaard and I think a lot of it is um but I think it's more the the mentality side of it as well I, I think we've been in a bit of a rut and getting a player like that you know, improves your football, but also makes you think, okay, we've got a fresh start here. We can actually move back towards what we've done when we've been really successful, um, ditching that, that four, four, two formation or four, two, four or whatever it is. And, and playing back to, to how we know, because I think we forget with, with Arteta's football, it is formulaic. It is, um, you know, a lot of patterns, uh, positional movement. And I think when you change things and you take such a key cog out, everything changes. And now look, some of my mates would, were saying to me, oh, well, you know, Arteta's football's shit if it's based on one player. But it's not just about that, is it? It's a, it's a much wider implication for the rest of the team, one key cog being out. And I think that's that's what we've seen. And hopefully um, with Odegaard back, we can get back to our best. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. I think we were talking about it on a pod that I released yesterday, which was a sort of Q&A podcast where... I was sort of responding to some of the questions that have been sent to me over the last week or so. And one of them was around our squad building and whether or not we've built the squad in the right way. And although I think generally we have, and I think at times it's very easy to kind of look at squad building and and pinpoint that as a problem. But actually you just have have ended up with unprecedented amount of injuries. For example, we've got so many right back options. We've got Timber, we've got White, we've got Tomiyasu. And there was a point where all three of them were out and all three of them were a doubt. So that isn't squad building. That's just rotten luck. And I think if I did have one criticism of our squad building, it would be that we have prioritised the physical players, the players that bring us that side of things. And at times neglected, I think, what we require from a technical and more sort of flair standpoint. And, you know, without Odegaard, we were seriously lacking in that. And him coming back in the side has made a massive difference. So, that's my one criticism of Mikel, but as you say, the football's not crap. The football's been some of the best football we've ever seen um, when it's been in full flow and working. It's just that we've had so many issues to deal with 
that has set us back. And we've got another issue to deal with potentially at the minute as well, because uh, it was reported yesterday that Ben White has undergone a minor surgical procedure to resolve a knee issue that he's been carrying. Now, over the years that he's been an Arsenal player, we've often looked at Ben White and said, this guy's just incredible. Like, regardless of whether he's carrying a knock or not, he still powers through, he still pushes through, and his level of performance, considering, is just really, really high all of the time. I'm not surprised to hear that he's got an issue that they've decided to put him under the knife for, because I would argue that at the start of this season, Ben White's level has dropped slightly and we've seen him miss more games than he has done in previous seasons because of that issue but I think you can see it can't you you could see that he was carrying something and if this means we're without him for a period of time but he's back stronger and ready to go for the business end of the season then this is something that surely needs to be done yeah it needs to be done but as you say harry it comes at an unfortunate time for us i think when we're looking for for rhythm in the team and we're looking for a consistent 11 a bit like what we had last season and the season before you know it comes at a, at a tough time um because we need we need some consistency um in the 11 but also in our style of football um and and you're right i don't think he's been anywhere near the levels that that he's he's been previously for us and that that could be because of this issue um Sounds like it is definitely, uh, and and ultimately, what what we need is the best version of Ben White. Because for me, the best version of Ben White is someone who offers us uh, attacking impetus as well as defensive. And I feel like over the past sort of year or so, his role has become a bit more withdrawn, um, and it leaves Saka a bit too isolated for me. And that when we are at our best, we know we're a very right hand side dominated team we have that trio of White, Odegaard and Saka, you know, all interchanging, all moving, causing opposition problems. Because I think one of our main problems um, recently definitely has been that we're too one-dimensional down the right-hand side because we've not had Odegaard. We've not had maybe a fully fit Ben White. It's basically the, the ball's been given to Saka and it's like, okay, you've got two, three defenders on you. What can you do? And he's so good that often he can beat two players uh, because he's just an exceptional talent. But it's too much to ask for him to to do that essentially, um, and I, I really hope that Ben White can get back to his best and get back to playing the way that the, the way that we we've seen him in, in the past. But I think the the overall as a wider point, I think the overall composition and we've spoken about this has has been off a little bit, and I think you know versatility is is fantastic, and the fact that we you know have got Ben White who can play right back and centre back, and we've got Tommy Asu can play right back and left back and Calafiori can play multiple positions and so can Yuri and Timber. I think it almost doesn't give you that consistency and fluidity of of movement tactically um, because when you're interchanging positions quite a lot, you don't have that sort of set mindset of when I'm here, I need to do this and I'm going to link up with this player and this player I've built a really good relationship with. Um, so, I mean, the hope is that we can really get back to full fitness and we can maybe try and nail down a bit more of a starting eleven like we've like we've seen before. I know that that's impossible, and you know the best teams interchange like that. But I'm just not quite sure we're ready for that just yet. Yeah, and I guess the the timing of this is interesting. You you're right to point out that the timing isn't great. It's never great when you're going to lose a player that would be a starter for you in your best eleven. But I think sort of reading reports that both Ricardo Calafiori and Takahiro Tomiyasu are due to return after the international break. That kind of makes me think that that's why Arsenal have chosen to address this issue now. They probably knew about it for a while. We know that Ben White's missed games as a result of it. They've probably been looking at it for some time and thinking, OK, can we get him through one more week or two more weeks because we're really thin, we're really desperate at the minute. But coming into this period now where you're hoping that, you know, T Tommy Asu and Calafiori will return very, very soon, it makes sense to take Ben White out of the occasion now and out of the fold now to make sure that he can have this minor surgery that's required and therefore recover from the problem that he clearly has. But um, yeah, fingers crossed he's back nice and soon because he's a really, really important player. As you say, I completely agree, by the way, on the versatility point. I think that the, there's t this is twofold. I think the first thing is, as you say, that tactically it impacts your patterns when different players are playing every week. But the other thing for me is that you are you're essentially relying on one body at times to cover you in multiple positions. 
And then if you get an injury to that one body, that one player, you can then be short in multiple areas as a result of that. So if Timber is your right back cover, but he's also your left back cover and he's your centre back cover, well, one injury to Timber means that you're yeah. short in all three of those positions if that's the route that you go down. And I guess it's about finding the balance because what you want to do is you want to buy uh, the best players, which cost the most money, which means that if you spend that money on someone who can cover a, a multitude of positions, you would argue that that's, that spend is more justified because it is helping you in multiple areas. But it, there's, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because as we've just discussed, there's some drawbacks to that as well. Another bit of news that we've read over the last couple of days, and it is a really slow, slow news period. We know that it's the international break. We thank you uh, for being with us. Uh, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a like, it really, really does help. Subscribe, all the rest of it. Join us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the chronicles of aguna where we've got uh, a piece of content coming up on kai havertz that we're going to record straight after this but it'll be available to you guys on saturday do check it out but another bit of news is with regards to perhaps some conversations that could be quite important in how arsenal move forward we know that the arsenal executives are traveling over to the united states to meet with the cronky family and this is alleged uh, to be with regards to transfer plans. But Mike, first of all, you'd assume there'll be a discussion around what happens with Edu as well, right? Yeah, yeah, you'd, you'd like to think so. And um, we spoke about this this Edu thing recently. Um, and I think, look, it, it's really, really important that we get that sorted because I think a lot of the this whole team has been, you know, the the mind of him and then, and then also Arteta as well. And I think those two working... Um, in tandem is really really important and and I think um, there was news about the Real Sociedad sporting director uh, leaving yesterday wasn't there and I think a lot of people have have thought oh you know that kind of makes sense um, you know with with, with Arteta's background um, at that club obviously um, and obviously there's a lot of Basque influence I think as well uh, in the at Arsenal and and in the Premier League as well and I think that it kind of people putting two and two together and, and getting six maybe. Um, but it kind of seems like the the sign of the kind of signing, if they were going to go that route and get an external candidate, the kind of signing that, that, that they would make. And I think, yeah, it's in, it's imperative. And you'd, you'd like to think that the January transfers have been drawn up already. I think these things are sort of done far in advance, but to get that summer sorted, um, yeah, it will need to be quick for sure. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think, with all the injury problems we've had at the start of the season, I think the mood around whether the squad is good enough to go on and achieve what we want it to has probably changed a little bit. Now, to be fair, there were some that even at the end of the summer window said uh, we haven't quite done enough here. There were a lot of people that were against the signing of Raheem Sterling, for example. I was all for that one. But just very quickly on that one, Mike, it hasn't really worked yet, has it? Because... We have been in situations where we've been chasing games, where we've been chasing goals, where we've lacked a creative spark. We've desperately needed that creative spark. We brought this guy in to be that and we don't turn to him. We don't seem to want to bring him off the bench. We don't seem to believe, at least internally, that he can actually influence a game or have a big impact on the game, in which case I'm questioning what the point in signing him was. So is it that he's not doing it in training, do you think? Is it that, um, you know, he's not quite as sharp as he needs to be? What, what do you think that's down to? Because Arteta spoke so highly of this guy. He really did, you know, sell us the dream of Raheem Sterling coming in. It makes perfect sense for everybody. It's going to work. It's going to help us. It still might, but we're in the middle of November now and I'm not really seeing it. I think, honestly, Harry, I just think he's not, he's not the Man City Sterling. And anymore, I think he's he's spent, um, you know, time at a club with Chelsea that have gone through turmoil. They've gone through loads of different managers, and he's not been fancy there. I don't think he's been loved there. And I think with a, a lot of players, that you know, it's something not that it's not tangible, but you can see it sometimes when, when a player feels like they're completely respected, loved that that they're, they're, they're part of it, and it doesn't feel like at Chelsea. You know, he was he, even by the fans. I think you know when he had that horrendous free kick in the in the FA Cup. I think it was against Leicester, and the fans booed him. Um, I mean, that's not going to culminate in a player who's confident, who is feeling at the top of his game. And 
ultimately those standards from Man City to Chelsea are going to drop massively. You're with Pep Guardiola, who's one of the best coaches in the world. And then you go into a situation at Chelsea where there's so much uncertainty and you're bought, you know, into this era, in, into the Bowley era as someone who's going to transform the club. Um, and that, that's how it was seen by a lot of people. When that doesn't happen, you've got to question what that does to a player uh, mentally as well. But but also looking at you know the the quality on the pitch and the quality of the of the coaching, it, it's it's not there, is it? So I think he's probably regressed as a as a player. Um, maybe he's less confident now. And I think coming to Arsenal, he's probably had a bit of a shock of like, okay, this is a, a very very serious operation. You know, there's there's elements of it that are serious to how I would have played under under Pep. Um, it, it's very. Uh, difficult, and, and we've spoken in the past about you know Gabriel Martinelli. We said, is he ever going to get it? Get Arteta football, and eventually he did. Um, but with wingers, particularly, I think it, it's really, it's really, really difficult. Um, it's you know you're you're expected to to do a lot because it's not like traditional football. You have you know overlapping fullbacks all the time, or you have loads of options. Often our, our wingers are tasked with taking on two, three players, like I was saying with Saka. Unfortunately, Saka is good enough to do that, but. This current iteration of Sterling, I don't see him as confident enough. I don't see him as, um, you know, tactically intelligent enough to understand what what he's he's being asked to do. Um, and and yeah, I think that's just culminated in 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 what we're seeing. I mean, I'm hoping it can improve, and hopefully we can bring him on in games where we're winning in, in the future, and he gets a bit more of a confidence boost. But let, let's not forget, we don't have Europa League anymore. We don't have that sort of um, arena where we can say to players, you know rebuild yourself or go give yourself a confidence boost by scoring two or three against you know a, a lesser side we don't have that um so and so when he's asked to come in in the, the european night it's just against a really tough um, opposition so so look i think it's 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 really really tough for raheem sterling um we know he has the quality in there it's just i think whether arteta can draw that back out of him and at the moment it doesn't look like it yeah you're absolutely right i think he's not at the level yet and I don't know if we're going to see him get to the level in time for that signing to be looked back on as one that was worthwhile. Um, I guess the, the financial outlay was minimal. You know, we're, we're, we're not even paying all of his wages. It feels like a deal that made sense financially. And maybe the club are willing to take a gamble as a result of that. But as, as far as his impact on the pitch goes so far, we, we haven't seen the rewards from that. I think it's fair to say at this stage. We talked about the executives going out to the US to have those conversations with KSE to plan potentially for the summer. What do you think is needed at Arsenal? What, what are you still looking at as an area and maybe thinking that's a bit of a weakness? What, what do you still believe is missing from this squad? Everybody says striker. Is it as simple as going out and getting a top striker and that's going to convert us from sort of being, you know, title challengers to title winners? Is it that easy or is mm. there multiple positions you still look at and think need addressing? I think it's it's really tricky because when I initially looked at this, I did a sort of um, depth chart and I looked at where we were strongest and defence is, you know, clearly been uh, a cornerstone of this Arteta team. And it, it, he has built this team from the defence to the attack. Um, and... I look at that and I don't think there really needs to be any improvements to the start in 11. I think we've done quite a lot of that in, in Timber and, and Calafiori um, recently. Uh, so I wouldn't say that defence is a priority. Um, I think where we're struggling really is the, is the midfield balance and getting more goals in, in attack. I think those are my priority areas that I would look at. And I think um, when in the summer we had a chat and it, I think this has been the what most Arsenal fans have drawn as a conclusion of the midfield um, bit, how the midfield looks is that it will be Declan Rice, Martin Odegaard and Mikel Marino. I think that was generally accepted as what we thought the midfield would look like. Now, unfortunately, um, and he had issues with this at England as well, Declan Rice and got quite a bit of stick for it. I'm just still unconvinced that he is the number six that we need. I think he can do it at a club like West Ham where, um, you know the football's different. It's a it's a, a lot more off ball work, and you're less in possession. But for a team like Arsenal, and we've seen it in recent games when when Rice has played in that position, we just really struggle to to progress the ball. I think that is that is the main thing, and that is what Thomas Partey ultimately is is best at. Um, 
so I think seeing the, the difference between them two has been quite stark. So I think that is an area that we need to sort out. Um, Mikel Marino, I think we've spoken about him. I thought he was actually quite good at Chelsea, to, to be fair. When he, he, was, came on. he was. He was. Yeah, he looked much better. I thought, OK, actually, this is the kind of play that we want. So maybe we need to be a bit more patient with that one and, and see a bit more from him in a functioning team. Um, and then attack. I, th- I still think we, we lack goals um, from from the left-hand side. I think, you know, I did praise Martinelli, uh, Martinelli earlier, but I think he needs to, he needs to step up in that sense. Um, and if he can't do that by the end of the season, I think we probably need to have a conversation about, do we need an upgrade in that area? Trossard is obviously a very handy player, but as we've spoken about in this podcast, extremely inconsistent. And when you're going for a title, you can't have that. And when I look at, you know, our competition and particularly Liverpool, for me, they've got like six pretty top, top level attackers and that's having lost Sadio Mane as well um, but you've got Jota you've got Salah you've got Gakpo Diaz um, Chiesa who's barely kicked a ball you know they've got real depth Darwin and, Nunez and Darwin Nunez they've got so much depth and talent there and for me you know they can interchange and still be extremely dangerous we can't interchange I think if you take you know maybe Martelli for Trossard is you know here and there but if you take Saka out for Sterling who's our backup we know we look average if you take the current iteration of jesus and put him in the team instead of Havertz, again we don't look great so i think that depth it's not even depth really it's more quality of you know the the, the squad um in, in general in attacking areas i think needs to needs to improve those two i, I would say yeah i completely agree with that i think the the midfield issue is a bigger one than the striker issue um, I completely agree with you on Declan Rice. I don't think he's ever been that guy that's going to get the ball and make you tick. He's he's great at carrying the ball. He's great at moving you through the thirds that way. But to get on the ball and sort of play passes early through the lines in the way that Thomas Partey can, it's just not what Declan Rice does. And I think there's a lot of people out there that would tell you that they be- believe Declan Rice is a six first and foremost. And I, I think that when Mikel Arteta signed him, he probably thought that. I really do. And I'm not suggesting that Mikel Arteta signed the guy for £105 million without really understanding him or knowing what his strengths and weaknesses are. But he brought him in, I think, with one thing in mind and he's ended up going down a different route, moving him into the eight position. If you think back to last season, there was a period where we were really struggling, like the way we are now. And Declan Rice was moved out of the six role and Jorginho came into the side. And although Jorginho isn't this physical monster powerhouse that Declan Rice is technically he's I would say a better footballer and that showed and it got us going and it got us into a position where we were competitive again and Declan Rice was then given a different responsibility which was get forward but also babysit Jorginho a little bit because we know he's not very quick across the ground we know that teams will look to target that and that role seemed to suit Rice so much and I think he, 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 I won't say he improved over the season because he started the season very, very well. But I think we saw a different side to Declan Rice's game and a side that Mikel Arteta probably looked at and thought, this is what I want him to be in the longer term. I think we need that additional deep lying player. I think Thomas Partey surprised everybody this season, Mike. I, I was one of the people that really worried whether he was going to be able to um, to be at the level that we need him to be. And I would argue that up until now, he's been our best player this season. He's been outstanding. He's played it right back and he's done outstanding jobs there. He looks fitter, sharper than he has done in a long, long time. And then there's that lack of another creative midfield option in the absence of Martin Odegaard. So I would actually rather, and feel free to shoot me down if you disagree, we went and got two midfield players, then we go and get a centre forward in the, the the immediate term because I just feel like that's a much greater need and it's easy to look at us not creating chances or not scoring as many goals as we'd like and say well it's because we don't have a striker you need to create the chances and I don't particularly think that it's because we've been wasteful recently we just haven't been creating 100% and in preparation for this podcast I actually looked on FB Ref, which is a really good uh, stat website and I looked at what I mentioned earlier progressive passes and the the top players in in the top five leagues uh, in Europe this season and progressive passes is defined. They define it as completed passes, which move the ball towards the opponent's goal line at least 10 yards from its furthest point in the last six passes or 
any completed pass into the penalty area and it does exclude passes from the defending 40% of the pitch so not the penalty area not not the sort of first third of the pitch um and actually number 1 in Europe's top 5 leagues this season for progressive passes was Joshua Kimmich with 126 number 2 um a very familiar name Granit Xhaka um oh, with 125 player. Um, so, you know, that's that that's pretty interesting. And then also to, to continue the Arsenal theme, Massio Guendouzi was fifth with 96. Um, and for reference from an Arsenal current point uh, standpoint, Thomas Part is 47th with 65. Um, so, you know, this clearly is just a, an on-ball metric. And I think it, you know, yeah. it does show you um, that Granit Xhaka was an Arsenal player. We, you know, he did do this very well from that from that left eight position and, and surprised quite a lot of us. But the question has always been his his defensive, uh, you know, uh, capabilities and, and limitations. Um, so, you know, with all these stats, you need to take it in, into context. And I think it's quite interesting because you you made the point earlier about um, prioritizing physicality, and I think that that is what we have done. And when you have a midfield, I think we we played him in the field of Rice, Marino and Partey. And for me, like, can you imagine Arsene Wenger ever playing, ever never. playing that, that midfield? That, no, never. never that, and that's the point. That's yeah. the, this is the problem that we have now because Arsene Wenger was so focused on a technical level to the point where he neglected the physical side. And now I think we've got a manager that's gone the complete opposite way. Mm. And I think the best thing is to be somewhere in the middle of that. I mean, if you think about the Liverpool midfield, you could think of a couple of players that can get around the pitch, can close people down, can win the ball back for you. But also they've got creators in there. You look at Manchester City. Yes, there's a Rodri who's obviously great at doing both sides of the game. But you've got specialists. You've got your Bernardo Silvers. You've got people that are sort of in between like Mateo Kovacic. And at Arsenal, there just doesn't seem to be that balance right now. It seems to be Martin Odegaard in one category and everybody else in the other. And that makes us really heavily reliant on that one player. And he's a great player. And, you know, you want him in the team every time he's available. But there is no plan B right now. I'm not saying these two players would have made a difference, but we did let the two closest things to him in Smith Rowe and Fabio Vieira leave the club this summer. And we never addressed that issue with the balance in the midfield. So I think, yeah, it's definitely something we need to work on. Um, finally, Mike, just to, to round off the episode, I know you've got uh, a name in mind of someone that you'd quite like to see uh, the club go out and get. Um, who is it and, and why would you like to see him? Yeah, so I, I called this with Gabriel Jesus, didn't I, a few years ago? Um, so I'm not, say I'm, I'm not saying I can predict the future or anything. But um, yeah, so like I was saying, I think with... Um, and we, we said this in the, in the summer as well, before we signed Sterling, who's a slightly different player, but we did say that um, we need more goals from, from wide areas. And I think... What we're looking at ultimately is I don't think we're going to go out and spend 150 million on a on a uh, Gyokeres right now um, or a striker of that ilk. So I think ultimately what we're going to end up doing is signing someone versatile who can play off the left or up front. And now for me, I've always been a massive fan of Alexander Isak. I think he is incredible because he blends the 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 off the ball work and the the determination with like incredible skill on the ball and pace and behind and finishing ability. I think he's got a bit of it all really. He doesn't quite have the physicality of a Kai Havertz. You're not going to, you know, boot it up to him and he's going to, you know, battle defenders for it. That's not his game. But if you're looking for someone who is versatile, can play on the left through the middle and is slightly different profile to Havertz, I think he's the kind of person that I'll be looking for, whether that's realistic or not. I, you know, we, we don't know. New, Newcastle are going to want a lot um, for him. Um, we almost well, need that one. We almost need that situation to become untenable. Like we need Newcastle not to make the Champions League. We need Isaac and his people to be pushing really hard from yeah. their side to make yeah. that deal happen. Because otherwise, particularly with some of the politics in the Premier League, where you've got the sort of red cartel, if you like, as we're known, and then you've got the new the new money clubs where they feel like the the, the former money clubs or the the established clubs are you know, trying to ruin them. It's, it's, there's a awkward dynamic there, isn't there? So we kind of need the situation yeah. to fall nicely for us. Yeah, and also if he continues playing like, cause he, he had a bit of a slow start to the season. I think he, did he have a few injuries issues? Um, but the last few games, I think he's got four goals in his last three games. He's really, you know, come back with a, with a vengeance. 
Um, and last season he got 21 goals and two assists in the Premier League. I mean, you know, that's that's pretty good numbers. Like that's if you if you replace sort of if you put those numbers into our team, and I know obviously it's you know it's impossible to do that because Havertz offers different things. But if you add, you know, five, six, seven extra goals, you know, that might get us over the line in some of those really tight games last season um, that we that we failed to win. Um, the other name, and this is a bit a bit of an odd one, um, I, I guess, is uh, Omar Marmouche, who is currently on fire for for Frankfurt uh, yeah. in the Bundesliga. Um, this season, he's got 11 goals and and seven assists so far. Um, so 18 goal contributions in 10, 10 games, 10 starts, I think, which is incredible. And that's obviously um, Bundesliga only. Um, and he can also play off the left or up front. He's also extremely pacey, skillful. Um, so yeah, that was someone that I looked at as a, as a kind of uh, outside shout. I don't think he's you know, really been linked with us before or, or anything like that. He's probably not a name too familiar with, with loads of Premier League fans. Um, so, yeah, someone, someone like who can, you know, play up front, can play off the left, and ultimately, I would say an upgrade on not necessarily Kai Havertz, but definitely Gabriel Jesus, because I think this is the bit of the elephant in the room, isn't it? And I, I think if Jesus was at that level pre-knee injury, we wouldn't really be having this conversation because I think he's such a such a good player and offers so much, but we're just not seeing that at the moment. So I think that's where this stems from. Completely agree, Mike, completely agree. And as always, great stuff. Thank you uh, so, so much uh, for joining me. Really, really appreciate it. Make sure you give Mike a follow. His handle is in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the pod. Uh, whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening via audio, please do uh, give us your support. Uh, make sure you leave us a review as well if you're listening on Apple Podcasts especially. And we'll see you all again very soon with another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Until then, take care.